So my name is Christina McGonigal, and I decided to do my topic on police brutality in South Africa. Um, just wanted to start off by saying there is not a lot of research for this, so it was very, very hard to get kind of information for this topic. Um, so what I wanted to focus on was reasons as to why South Africans have a lot of trouble trusting the police. And I just wanted to start by comparing it to um, something that's published in the United States, if I can zoom in here. This is um, the police brutality ladder that is actually taught in um, police training when you go into the police academy. And what they do in the bottom is they start off with um, a complaint and, and then it goes all the way up to cooperative controls and then from cooperative controls all the way up to lethal force. Lethal force is like something that someone like least likely wants to resort to. Um, it's only taught to officers to use it if it's in like a true case of emergency which the officer or a citizen is going to be harmed. So police are not supposed to be using it, but in South Africa it's actually used most likely on a daily basis. And this is one of the reasons as to why people are having trouble trusting the police because it's not properly taught that how they're supposed to use um, exigent forces. So I wanted to relate it to by um, the Declaration of Human Rights by Article 7 and, and Articles 5. In Article 5, it says no one shall be subjected to cruel and inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. And I'm going to show you a couple of pictures in a little bit that are two current um, cases that happened in which a man was dragged by a policeman and another man was actually beaten and stripped nude in the street. And they were both videotaped and published to the web. Article 7 is all people are supposed to be created equal before the law and equal protection against any type of discrimination. But the problem is, is that South African citizens are being discriminated on a daily basis because their human rights are being stripped from them. Police are not having the ability to pretty much like decipher what is good and what is bad. They're just kind of punishing people on how they feel in the moment. And that's becoming like a big issue because people are not aware that their human rights are actually physically being violated. They just think that this happens on a daily basis and that this is how police are supposed to act around you. This is um, Susan, I cannot really pronounce her last name to be honest with you. She is a director for the um, Department of Public Safety. And one of the things that she actually just recently released, which I would not have expected from a person, is that she released a shoot to kill act. And this means that she's authorizing the South African police services to shoot and kill criminals on the scene. Whether or not they're doing something at the moment, they, she wants crime to stop. So she wants people to go in and engage with the communities. And if they see something wrong, she wants you to shoot the criminals. Her exact words were, I want you to shoot the bastards. She's like, you can shoot them and I will worry about the legal details later. She is a very, very ruthless person and is actually passed. And so a lot of South Africans feel that like they can still commit crime, but they have no idea as to when like something bad is going to happen to them. So if they get shot, they get shot. And like that's the way South Africans are taking it. They're taking it as if, well, this is right and this is what's going to happen. So one thing I wanted to focus on is what people are trying to say is being qualified to be a police officer in South Africa. You actually physically don't need any training. You can go in and apply to be an officer. They put you through very minimal training. You get a uniform, gun, et cetera. And some of the things that were kind of bothering me when I was doing research is that officers are taking um, bribes from people who they're arresting. So people are getting giving them bribes and gifts so that they don't be arrested in order to like decrease the police discretion towards them. They're also um, they're terrible at the response time. And it's leading to one of the reasons as to why South Africans don't trust them because a recent evaluation done by the Institute of Security um, was talking about how two thirds of the police force is absent on a daily basis. They have terrible record keeping and people are feeling that like, why should I call the police if they're not gonna be there for me? Um, there's also not a lot of visibility on the streets. So like people are not able to see the police patrolling, walking patrols, cars, nothing. There's nowhere for them to like report to. They're having a lot of trouble like identifying people that they can actually physically go to in some type of form of harm. If they're calling the police, they're taking a long time to get there because again, there's, tw there's like two thirds percent of absenteeism in like at a normal police force. And this is actually a picture of protesting women who um, 
th thinking that police brutality belongs to apartheid, and I'm gonna get that to, to that in a minute, but um, a lot of people think that police brutality should have died with apartheid and it actually continues on a daily basis in South Africa. So these are two recent photos. I know it's kind of a little blurry because you can't really see it, but this is a photo taken. It's actually a video from a cell phone. You can YouTube it and find both of these articles. This is recent, I believe this was last year, and it was actually a taxi driver who, it doesn't say what he was physically arrested for, but he was arrested. They pretty much beat him in public and then tied him to the back of a police van and they dragged him through town. This is the part in which the police were actually physically holding him to the van. The van actually ended up speeding up and taking off, and the police lost control of him, and he just ended up being dragged through town. He later died that day in the hospital from his injuries. This recently happened in March. This is a gentleman who was beaten, as you can see, by several police officers uh, in public. He was actually originally clothed, they stripped him and started beating him in public and this was taken by two women in an apartment building um, on the sideline. The women were actually later arrested for taking the video as a violation of police rights. So going off of have you heard from Johannesburg, these are two pictures. One is from the Soweto uprising and the other one is from um, the uh, Sharpsville massacre. These are both two early event instances in which police brutality was directly related to. In the um, Soweto uprising, the children were just like marching through the street and they were pretty much shot at. There was really no reason leading up to it and it, they were fired with tear gas and then open shots were fired into public. In the Sharpeville massacre, people were protesting against the past books and um, there was an instance in which an officer was actually, um, I don't know how to really say it, he was, he, he was actually like pushed over and it wasn't anyone's fault, he was more like shoved into and he fell over. Well, the other officers who were patrolling the roof thought that he was getting stoned and they decided to shoot people in public. Um, so again, it's violating people's rights because they're actually not doing anything wrong and it's not re representing that ladder of lethal force because in order to, in, sure lethal force someone physically has to be harming you harming the public right then and there and it was more like the police just up and went and did it and didn't really think very much of it until like the after fact so at a local level one of the things that i want to touch on was definitely the police academy the police academy has seven different several different classes in which you're required to take you actually have to take 818 hours worth of classes in those classes they're going to teach you all the different types of police um, force that you're supposed to use and how you're sp properly support, supposed to sorry, address citizens. They also teach you property, uh, protocols of police control and police patrol as well as discretion in interacting with the public. On a national level, the Fourth Amendment, it was added into the Tennessee v. Garner case in which two uh, police officers opened fire on a child who was actually involved in a burglary but he only stole $10 from a home. Uh, they pretty much just open fired on him because they thought that he was a criminal suspect. So it was added into the Fourth Amendment that you can no longer um, excuse, uh, present lethal force unless it's absolutely necessary. On a global level, I just wanted to touch on the fact that in other countries, people are doing the same exact thing that we are. We are making police academy presentable and people being required to do it and that it's really important for you to do it in South Africa because right now the qualifications to be a police is basically nothing and there's no way for like anybody to do anything as prevention. That's it. Thanks for waiting. Questions? <laughs> Did you look at police systems in other kind of like developing countries to see the similarities to that, to like South Africa? When I was looking at the ones from England, it was literally not for South Africa, but it was almost exactly the same way it was for um, the United States. The only problem is is that a lot of other countries don't really post their qualifications; they kind of just give it to them. As far as South Africa, they didn't have any qualifications that I could find as it was to be a police officer. So why do you think there's police brutality going on? I think it's because it's like lingering from apartheid because honestly it's like the way that I'm looking at it from like a sociological criminal justice perspective is that 
it's like embedded into sociology and it's like really, really hard for people to actually physically change what they're doing. It's the same thing when I went to Nicaragua. Like once it's conditioned into a society, it's hard for them to adjust to something that's new. And I think because it just continued for so long that people think that that's the way it's gonna have to be. What about uh, if there was training that occurred though? Because oh, if there was training that occurred, so you're saying that they're not trained, but if there was training, do you think that that cycle that could have be broken? I think that it can be broken, but again, I think it's going to take a lot for police to not get like the habits that they're used to being. Because again, people are like learning by what they're taught, and so all, not all the time when you go to school, you're taught like like what you're supposed to do is different than when you do in the real world. So I think that they'll be taught it and they'll apply it, but it'll still be like not as widely distributed. And you mentioned that um, you know the police at some points are incompetent. But if the police aren't protecting the community, who, who is protecting the community? A lot of people don't think that anybody is. Most of the research that I found, it's they legitimately do not trust the police at all. People just don't go to them unless they absolutely physically have to. Yeah. So did you see anything about it being like gangs running the towns? That, no, they didn't say anything about that because it wasn't directly related to police brutality. So the only thing that I did find is that they weren't um, they were less likely to go to townships rather than like rural communities. Ashley. I was just curious, did you look up the rates of police brutality in the U.S. or anything like that? The police brutality in the U.S. though is, I looked it up, but it's also segregated by the types of brutality. Like it's not really brutality, it's more like the types of cases that police went to. And like for South Africa, you, in like the United States you can do it by like gender, race, everything. South Africa, it's just by towns. So the only thing that it would tell me was that like in South Africa it's a 313 increase, but in the United States it's rarely ever seen. Was, um, was there a specific group that they target in South Africa for police brutality? It's called the Rambo Squad, the Rainbow or Rambo Squad, but it's um, there. I posted a YouTube video of it in one of my blogs. It's like a section of the South African Police Service in which they like have been specifically focusing on, but actually all the different police departments are under evaluation from the Institute of um, Security Services. Would you read your question? Well, is there I was sermon? asking like if they like specifically target women and like, nope, the there's no research themselves. for it. Actually, um, Christine and I were trying to discuss it earlier that I could not find any research as to male, female, or racial profiling. They actually their only stats that they publish are um, their crimes by the towns. 